Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, good morning or good evening to all of you, depending on your time zone. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Mark Jacobson. I am an active duty Air Force officer, currently a professor of technology and innovation at the Air Force's School of Advanced Air and Space Studies in the United States. I'm also a writer and former entrepreneur, and I founded and led a software development team slash exploitation team that does UAS and counter UAS at the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, DIUX, which is now DIU, Defense Innovation Unit, a DOD organization in Silicon Valley. And what I wanna to do today is offer a government perspective on what the last few years have looked like, with a very fast moving, uh, evolving technology. And I'm gonna give a special focus to what the interface between the private sector and government looks like. I imagine much of the audience uh, sits within government or within the private sector trying to figure out how we work together, how to do business with government. I want to offer some insights into why government can be a challenging customer to deal with and what some of the big tensions and trade-offs are on drone-related issues um, and giving a special attention to how government copes with something that moves so fast. So i got to give you a few uh, caveats up front, the standard DOD disclaimer that I'm speaking for myself here. It's work I've done in government, but I am still active duty. I can't speak for the government, only for myself. The second caveat I'll give is that my involvement with Rogue Squadron came to an end about two years ago when I moved to my professor job. So my part of the story will end in around 2020, and uh, the story of Rogue Squadron beyond that is for others to tell. But I was still there for some key moments. Uh, and the third thing I'll, I'll mention is I can't talk too much about specific projects for obvious sensitivities, but I think there will still be a lot here that's relevant. So I want to tell you a little bit about my background and how I got into drones because it's relevant. I started my career as a C-17 cargo pilot delivering cargo into dangerous places. And I also detoured for a while to go learn Arabic and live in the Middle East for two years. And I was there when the Syrian civil war started. And around 2014, I was doing research among Syrian refugees in Turkey. And at the time, the Syrian government was starving out entire cities to break the will of people there and flush out rebels and also targeting medical infrastructure. And people asked me why the Air Force couldn't come in and deliver cargo. And I had to explain you can't just fly big cargo planes into the middle of hostile countries or they'll get shot down unless you essentially go to war first to clear the airspace. But that got me thinking in the modern world, there has to be some way you could get aid through this contested airspace to people that need it without having to use military force. And to make a very long story short, I envision this paradigm of swarming packets of aid, building a kind of air bridge into one of these communities. Uh, I should mention this picture here was a rare food delivery in a besieged suburb of Damascus called Yarmouk. And this came out while I was in Turkey. And I spent a lot of time looking at this envisioning how you could build an air bridge. And that got me looking at small drones. I had an engineering background. My dad founded and owned a hobby store when I was growing up. I did a lot of software development uh, on the side. So I'd been around technology. I'd never used drones before, but this was, this was the 2014 era. It was kind of the heyday of 3DR, open source stuff, um, Pixhawks, Ardu Pilot. So I started ordering stuff just to learn and really started in my garage with my own resources, doing my own research, trying to see, is this viable? And over the next year and a half, we built that idea into a nonprofit corporation called Uplift Aeronautics. We built a real team. I was doing my Stanford, uh, or my PhD in political science at Stanford, where I was able to recruit some fantastic engineers. And we built out a paradigm that could deliver uh, 100, well, at 100 kilometer round trip ranges, deliver a two kilogram package, which isn't very much, but our goal was really just to show a proof of concept that this was possible. And because we were trying to slip aid into hostile places, we had to think about things like how to fly covertly, how to avoid detection by RF, um, how to manage flight profiles to minimize noise, how to get the reliability we needed. Um, and the use case of moving a humanitarian package through contested airspace is unfortunately the exact same problem set of how an adversary could go drop a grenade. So I learned an awful lot about being an insurgent. Um, we, we had a lot of success. We built a great demonstration of our capability, but we were all volunteers. We had a lot of problems. We, we flamed out, just we couldn't sustain the level of effort as volunteers. Um, 
on July 3rd, 20, I think it was 2015, we crashed a drone at Stanford, LiPo battery caught fire, and I have the distinction of having burned down three acres of Stanford's campus, which was not the finest day of my life. And we ended up dissolving the organization. Uh, I would like to report an immediate process of picking myself back up, but that kind of put me into the wilderness for a couple years of just healing and recovering from this kind of scorching entrepreneurial experience as I was trying to finish my PhD. And if you'll indulge me for a, a tangent here, uh, I did go on to write a book about this. So if you have an interest in this story, you can find this on Amazon. But I, I tell the whole story of the Syria Airlift Project. Um, but really what this gave me was a passion for mental health among entrepreneurs, which may resonate with some of you. The stresses that we don't talk about, the imposter syndrome, the doubt, navigating ambiguity. And then when something does fall apart, business is not working out like we hoped. Uh, it can take a real toll and we don't talk about that process and how to manage it so this has become a passion of mine and i wrote this book to kind of be a guide to help others who are struggling through this the dark night of the soul that can come with entrepreneurship so if that catches your interest it's on amazon i've also got my website there www.markdjacobson.com all right tangent over getting back to drones uh, around 2016 to 2017, I, I thought I was done with drones. I'd boxed up everything I'd done and hadn't touched it for a couple of years. The Islamic State's precursor, ISIS, uh, started weaponizing drones for the first time. And I had dealt with this technology so much that I obviously saw the, the implications of where this was all headed. And the first real drone attack came when uh, ISIS sent an X-8 Skywalker that was booby-trapped and some Kurdish soldiers picked it up and it exploded and killed them. And that started a flurry of commentary of people online about weaponization of drones. So I wrote a piece about it, got noticed. I basically talked about the learning curve I'd had to climb as an insurgent and what the learning curve of you know, real insurgents was going to be and the challenges they would face. That got, got me hired at the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, which the DOD had planted in Silicon Valley to help acquire commercial technology. And... Uh, Things heated up very rapidly. ISIS went from flying, you know, one Phantom Four doing surveillance to X-8 Skywalkers to 12 drones at a time dropping grenades in Mosul, and they could they could target very precisely. I view this not just as a nuisance terror technology, but as really a revolution in military warfare because now you've given anybody in the world precision guided munitions, where for $500 any bad actor can go precisely place an explosive on any point on the ground. And that's truly game changing when you consider that the way we usually deploy a military force is to buy a $200 million airplane, park it on a parking ramp behind a fence and call it secure. Um, we have the same problem with ships and other assets. So this really does change the game. And I, at DIUX, wanted to get involved and help on this, this front. Um, even as that was happening, I realized that we have we have two problems here, and I call them the red and the blue. The red problem is how we defend against adversary drones. The blue problem is how we supply drones to the good guys. My perspective is US centric, obviously, because I'm a US military officer, but it's the same for any friendly country and not just military. We have infrastructure inspection. We have, uh, in our case, the Department of Interior fighting wildfires, um, lots of different organizations, police forces, and Around the time I got to DIU, uh, 3DR imploded. We saw headlines like these. Uh, DJI came out very quickly, moving from the Phantom series up to the Mavic. They took off. They were releasing new models every six months. And everybody in government who wanted a drone wanted a DJI because they were far and above the best drone out there. Anything in second place was a very distant second place. And this became a national security concern, especially as people started asking questions about all this coming from a Chinese company that was very closely uh, wed to the Chinese state. So we were simultaneously starting to face these two problems. Now, I, I said I would talk about the interface between government and the private sector, which can often be messy and complicated. Um, and I, I learned that right away. DIU's primary job is to broker contracts with industry. We usually don't build things ourselves. We go out to industry to find solutions. But I saw a number of problems that as I was listening to pitches. Uh, for the first thing, uh, we, we had a lot of great companies that came through, a lot of really pr 
promising tech, but we also had companies uh, that were a little bit problematic and DOD was not a very smart customer. We would have someone come in and say, oh yeah, we can do Mavlink. And everyone in the room nodded and said, okay, they do Mavlink. And I would raise my hand and say, what do you mean by do Mavlink? Can you listen to raw packets? Can you intercept them? Can you pull out lat longs? Can you inject packets? And are you talking about Mavlink 1 or 2? Because Mavlink 1 has no security features. Mavlink 2 has packet signing to prevent injection. And what radios are you talking about? Because Mavlink is just a protocol that could flow over any radio. Are you talking about $25 uh, sick radios like all the hobbyists were using? Because those never had security at all. And you can get exploits on YouTube. Or are you talking about leading state-of-the-art encrypted radios? Because that's a different story. So uh, I realized the importance of being a smart consumer. We also unfortunately had uh, at least one case where I'm pretty sure a company falsified a test on a range. So I had the idea of starting a red team inside DIU where we could act like bad guys and take companies out on the range and fly against them to get away from PowerPoint decks and look at how does this technology actually work? And we have real conversation about, you know, where's the promise and where isn't there? Um, and that was the genesis of the Rogue Squadron team to be a red team. There's another problem in government, which is that we're requirements driven. So to build or buy anything, government is supposed to have what's called a validated requirement. And I think of this as a big R requirement that's laid out in official processes. Some troop sees a drone out in the battlefield. It's, let's just say a Phantom Three. They put a request up and it grinds its way through the bureaucracy. And months later, a requirement comes down to industry for an RFI. Hey, we need a capability to, to deal with a Phantom Three. Well, by the time that hits industry and gets contracted and purchased, we might be up two years later, three generations of drones later. And um, I, as someone who knew the technology, knew that we were we needed to look way beyond the Phantom 3. We needed to be looking at RF dark Skywalkers that weren't broadcasting because there's no radios in them. They were flying pure auto. We needed to look at multiples because sooner or later, people would figure out how to fly multiple drones at the same time. So we had to get ahead of the requirements process. And requirements also get very difficult for industry because Oftentimes, what industry builds is not what government's asking for because government's asking for the wrong thing or an outdated thing, or they have their own special military flavor. Now, there's also some structural problems government faces. I want to talk about a few trends about how the public sector interfaces with, with uh, the private sector. We all know Moore's law, exponential increase in technology and computing power, processing speed. And we've also had this software development revolution. This is from a DevOps report. If you are a company or a government team or any organization that employs best practices for DevOps, things like continuous integration and deployment, automated testing, automated deployments, uh, you can deploy code 200 times faster uh, uh, or 200 times more code deployments, 100 times faster, 2,600 times faster recovery from failure and a seven time lower failure rate um, and over someone who doesn't use those processes. And unfortunately, government um, is not the best, best adopter at DevOps. Um, wait just a second. Um, so we were getting exponentially further behind all these advances in industry. Now, government has its own exponential logic, unfortunately. This is a plot, an exponential plot of the unit cost of fighter airplanes from 1910 to 2020. And a defense analyst, uh, last name Augustine, plotted all these and found an exponential increase in the unit price of fighter jets. And if you walk that through to the conclusion, you get this alarming conclusion, somewhat tongue in cheek, that in the year 2054, the entire defense budget will purchase just one aircraft. This aircraft will be shared by the Air Force and Navy three and a half days a week, except for leap year when it goes to the Marines. So this exponential breakdown of the defense pro uh, procurement process works um, almost at odds with exponential increase in speed of industry and delivering capability. And what you get out of that is headlines like these, where there is a, a breakdown in government capability. We have readiness crises. We're struggling to retain personnel because we're so frustrated. We don't know what to do about threats like drones. My favorite headline up here, the, the USS Zumwalt built around a rail gun, can't fire it because the ammo costs $800,000 per round. Um, and we see this kind of exponential breakdown in a lot of different technology areas. 
We've also got some spending challenges here. The bottom line of this slide is that back in 1967, the US government spent 61% of the world's R&D budget, and about 19% of that was DODs. In 2017, the US has shrunk to 30%. Only 4% of that is DOD, and 27% of global R&D is now Chinese, uh, a, a near peer competitor to the United States. So we've moved into a world where the US is relatively getting further and further uh, behind, or at least eroding its lead on R&D. And uh, to couple that with yet another trend, up until about 1980, this gray line here represents um, business, private sector R&D per year in billions of US dollars. The blue line is government. And until about 1980, those tracked pretty well. But around 1980, there was an exponential divergence where the private sector started spending more and more and more relative to government. So our entire government procurement process was in, in um, innovation institutions were built for a world where the government was in the lead doing R&D and tech transferring that out to industry. We are now in a world where the majority of R&D comes from industry. They're the ones out front and government's trying to catch up. One last slide to drive that home. Uh, the blue column here is if you add up like most of the defense industrial base in the United States, the big companies that win defense contracts, all of their R&D combined per year is about equal to Apple's or less than Google or Amazon. So we really have a world where government has to learn to better use commercial tech, which is moving exponentially faster thanks to Moore's law and the software revolution. Now let's get back to drones. We can see this pace of technology if we look at the release cadence of new drones. This slide shows each box is a different drone in the top section. I've got most of DJI up there and then a few extra drones from other companies. Phantom 2 rolls out 2013. By around 2015, we get rapid succession of the Phantom 3, 4. For those who remember that season, the Mavic came out shortly after that and blew everybody away. Uh, that's what the that's what gov that's what the private sector is producing. Well, what's government using? In the United States, the the kind of leading small quad that was being issued at the time was the Instant I Mark II Gen 3, which was from 2011 and had parts from 2004. So this was kind of the mil spec standard, and we all know a drone is basically a flying cell phone. So imagine that you're a soldier going to war against the Islamic State, and they're all armed with Mavic Pros, and you're issued a 2004 2011 vintage, you know. A, equivalent of a Nokia flip phone, uh, that's a pretty bad place to be. And that's not to pick on a particular company. It's just the result of what the defense procurement process produces. And this illustrates, uh, I put Android up here as a comparison. The way the military or the government often thinks about things is we can't trust what industry makes. We need to put kind of a military hardening on it. And I'm aware of two government projects that tried to create military versions of Android by forking it. And to the best of my knowledge, both of those were stuck on Android 4.4, which is about eight years old now, and is not a particularly secure version of Android. Whereas in the private sector, we know that security comes through rapid releases and rapid patching. So there's a fundamental disconnect in the paradigm for how we provide security and how we meet requirements. And all of these things that affect software and phones have also affected drones. So here I'm at Rogue Squadron kind of looking at all this in the market on both the red and the blue side um, and trying to figure out how we should best use Rogue Squadron to help solve government problems. Some of you may be familiar with a theorist named John Boyd. He was a fighter pilot and his most known idea is the OODA loop, that if you're in a fight with an adversary, you're always in this cognitive decision loop of um, studying your environment, orienting, making a decision, and then acting. And whichever person has the faster OODA loop is going to outmaneuver the other. And the Defense Innovation Board, which is a commercial group of executives who advise DOD, said, if we're ever going to win in today's fights, we need an OODA loop to go faster, particularly with developing and deploying software. And this idea really became what we did with Rogue Squadron, is we, we started as a red team trying to catalyze uh, contracting and, and buying the right things. But we also had a lot of software developers and exploitation people, and we kept getting drawn into soldiers asking us for niche capabilities that industry hadn't provided yet. And one of the challenges in government is 
industry may have tons of solutions, but to actually get that contracted and into the field is really hard. We call that the valley of death. There's a ton of great experimentation and prototyping that happens, but the gates to get through all those things out to the field can take years, and the vast majority of prototyping and experimentation never crosses that valley to hit soldiers. Here we were in a world where new drones are coming out every three or four months, and the minute a new drone came out, we needed to try and find advantages. So we started delivering software uh, in response to user needs. We did some forensics tools. We uh, got very drawn into understanding security vulnerabilities of drones, uh, thinking about how to mitigate those, how to take advantage of them. We also got drawn into counter UAS, and that was largely by working with commercial partners where we could take a vendor's piece of technology and we could link it up to other DoD systems ourselves without having to necessarily contract every piece out. And we got very good at this. There was one case we got a call from uh, Syria. Some US troops had recovered a drone that we didn't yet support in our forensics tool. We had just got one in the lab. We took off the shrink wrap. The exploitation guys figured out what was different. The developers incorporated it into a product. And we turned around through our CI CD pipeline a new uh, app within two hours, or I should say a new build of our app that supported the drone from that initial request from Syria. So to me, that's the cadence of how we have to operate in a threat that evolves this quickly. Continuous integration, deployment of capability um, as fast as, as the private sector releases it. And this is very antithetical to how DOD usually works. Now, I wanna talk about some tensions that make all of this work really difficult in government and also make it hard for industry to work with government. The, the first one is this tension between supporting blue and defending against red. So let's say that you are tasked with providing secure drones to your government. What are the things you need? Well, you wanna make sure nobody can break into that data link and crack it and get your position or inject packets. You don't want people exploiting your logs and finding out where you took off from. So you wanna make sure those things are encrypted or hardened or not recorded at all. You don't wanna get detected. So you need to be able to fly silent and invisible and you don't want people jamming you or interfering with you. Well, now let's say that you're on the red side. Your job is to defeat enemy drones. What's your challenge? Darn right, you want to get inside those data links. You want to crack those open. You want to pull lat longs. You want to um, inject packets and take over. You need all those flight logs so you can figure out where the bad guys are. You definitely need ways to track the drone, to identify it, and uh, being able to interfere with the navigation, maybe land at a place of your choosing. Do, do we see a problem here? Uh, our requirements are diametrically opposed, and often in this industry, it's the same drones being flown by both sides because the leading drones come from industry. So uh, this presents a real problem of everything you do to make blue drones better increases the problems you're going to have on the red side and vice versa. And often different parts of government are tasked with different halves of this equation and in some ways working at odds with each other. And in some cases, like my team, you're actually working on both problems. So you're constantly facing these kind of quandaries of which of these things do we do or not? And that raises another tension. And this is, this is kind of a broader InfoSec challenge in general of when you find a vulnerability, should you disclose it or should you hang on to it to exploit? Um, the screenshot here, some of you are probably familiar with the DJI Rev community back in the day and uh, a lot of this open source um, RE hobbyists were posting different exploits they found and root kits and whatnot. And as all these vulnerabilities were coming out, the company can come along and close them. And it's generally viewed as a good practice to disclose vulnerabilities. So if you're a software developer and you're building your web application and your build pipeline fails because someone discovered that your, no your node package has got a vulnerability, uh, it gets patched right away. And now you're up and running again in 20 minutes with a new version, um, everyone benefits from vulnerability disclosure. But what about a case like a drone where this threat is so dangerous and so ubiquitous and the only leverage we have over it oftentimes might be leveraging a vulnerability. And it gets more complicated when these drones may come from a foreign associated company in a country with a government that's not exactly um, on best terms with the United States. So uh, that's a tension of just how you deal with this, especially when a lot of current mitigation tools against drones are based on RF. Uh, 
we've also got a challenge, and this is particularly true on the red side of how we um, how we deal with counter UAS. We need a system of systems, and you've probably, I, I wasn't able to attend all the talks today, but probably heard a lot about this, that no one modality works very well for detection and no one modality works great for uh, defeat. That um, you need cameras, you need acoustics, you need radar, and all those things working together might detect a drone. And you also need on the defeat side, a variety of things, everything from maybe from kinetics or directed energy to net capture or interceptors. So you have a lot of different nodes all talking to each other, and that introduces a need for standardization and protocols. And one of the things I've seen on the government side is government agencies spending years having huge stakeholder meetings, trying to agree on the protocols. And they're very slow to start building things until they get these protocol questions figured out. And there can be good reasons for that, but what it does is it dramatically slows things down. Oftentimes tech never gets built or fielded. And the contractual complexity of having a lot of different people building different modules can some, in some cases makes it impossible to make breaking changes to your protocols. I'm aware of some government projects that have bogged down to the point they're stuck on versions of protocols multiple years old because they can't contractually get everything moved over to the new version. So what did my team do? Well, we added another protocol. Uh, uh, and very aware of this comic, we knew those risks, but our philosophy was we're not going to wait to get a perfect protocol. We just need to start getting technology out the door today. If we can get some sensors out on bases, we can at least figure out how present the threat is. And if we can hold the line with something that just kind of barely holds together with spit and duct tape, start detecting, experiment with mitigation, get our troops familiar exercising on um, base defense with some of these technologies, over time, industry and the big government offices will come through with the more enduring solutions. And we were okay being in that front runner space with an 80% solution. Uh, but it is a trade-off and there's problems with that approach for sure. Another tension you run into, and anyone who's done business with government may have seen this, we often think of government as a big monolithic entity, when in reality, it's a hodgepodge of all kinds of different organizations in different stovepipes across a ton of different geography. So here is one example is a map of just Air Force bases in the United States. And you could imagine that a significant number of these bases probably have some knucklehead flying over in drones every once in a while. Uh, we don't actually know because a lot of these bases don't have any detection capability um, to speak of as we're trying to figure out what to field. But uh, the problem is ubiquitous. And any time a drone goes and creates a nuisance and someone sees it, there's probably an enterprising young person at that base who's gonna go out on his own initiative or her own initiative to conferences and trade shows and try and figure out what can I go buy that works? And they're gonna engage with industry and they're gonna just go buy something. Well, the government also has centralized offices responsible for buying things for the entire force. So those are called program offices typically in the Department of Defense. And if you're in a program office with the tasked mission of providing a capability for the whole force, what are you going to make of all these people going out and just buying random stuff? They hate it because now they're worried about, we've got 50 bases with 50 different technologies. Some of it might work, but probably a lot of it is snake oil. A lot of it doesn't work. Uh, they have no sustainment plan, no maintenance plan. Nothing's going to talk to each other. Um, and they're saying, guys, slow down. Just give us a year or two. We need to find the best five or six solutions. Give us some time. And then you guys can go buy off that short list. Uh, well, that has the advantages of creating standardization, but the problem is by the time those top five or six systems are chosen and made available, the threat has probably moved on and evolved multiple generations. So we're back in this tension between speed and um, and trying to get some kind of standardization, which which government likes. Uh, this also creates it creates opportunity for companies because you have a lot of points of engagement where you might sell technology to government. Uh, but a lot of this is going to be limited maybe to a small scale experiment. The real big wins is for a company to become part of a program office program because those were funded by Congress with a sustainment plan. And that's really where the valley of death comes is the small sales up to the a program office where you're officially adopted by a government agency. Um, there's also a tension with networks. We all know that the promise of networks with drone and counter drone technology, that when you start networking things together, you can pass video around, you can, if a drone flies over one area, you can pass a warning to another area. Um, if you've got blue force drones, you potentially have a swarm or, or combination tactics. But anyone who works in security also knows that whenever there's a network, there's huge vulnerability. 
I'm guessing that most of us on this call don't own Wi-Fi enabled toasters because that's the last thing we trust plugging into our router. Um, so there's a real tension about letting things on networks and government is very rightfully concerned about this and makes it really hard to certify things to go on networks. And you often find an, an instinctual desire to keep things offline. So even a lot of companies creating great cloud enabled systems often find themselves being asked by government to leave things offline. I've been part of multiple efforts that involve you know, driving a truck out to a sensor to pull the hard drive to get the data off of it, which is a terrible way to build a, a global counter UAS network capability. But those are the tensions in play. We've also got issues with data sharing and compartmentalization. Uh, this on the left is a sectional aviation map of part of DC. Um, and, and just within that one area, you know, again, we often think of government as a monolith, but in that one area, you've got Air Force bases, Army bases, Navy bases, Secret Service, Capitol Police, um, FAA jurisdiction. All of them have different organizational stovepipes. They also have different rules, particularly when you're talking about counter UAS where you're gathering data, you can very quickly run afoul of rules about gathering data on American citizens, which we have very strong laws to protect against that, as well as in a lot of other uh, friendly countries. So you often get cases where legally and by procedure and regulation, organizations are not allowed to share data. Well, when you've got a drone that can fly across this whole map in about 30 seconds, uh, I'm probably exaggerating a little bit, but not by much, and just cut through all of those jurisdictions, that creates a real problem. You also get really awkward situations, like one example I came across, uh, a government organization asked a vendor if they could remove the drones lat long from their counter UAS system. And they believed they didn't have the authority to view the drone's position that needed to be masked because of the law. I think that person was wrong, but those are the kind of absurd traps that government can get drawn into because of our rule of law rightfully to protect American citizens and, and safeguard information. We also often run into things where we can't put data on particular types of servers, different cloud services, if they're not certified to various standards. I'm a strong believer in uh, putting, making drone detection for like public events uh, mobile, that if you're a, a police officer out on the beat at a parade, for example, uh, you can have a display on your phone. So if a drone flies by, you can find it and find the operator. There's a prototype that we built in Rogue Squadron that did just that. But we often had trouble getting anyone to use it because the DOD's model was to have a person in a bunker looking at a computer screen uh, where that data was kind of safe in a government network. And they'd be on a radio trying to give instructions to police who are out on, uh, walking around uh, on where to find the drone. So this runs against how a lot of us would think is maybe the right way to solve a drone problem. But these are the kind of the realities of government. On the blue side, I also mentioned this need to know how to get secure drones to our troops, to industry, to other government agencies. Um, big risk of the monopolization of a market by any company, but particularly when that company is foreign. So there's been a lot of effort at DIU the last few years to, to do that. A lot of that came from DIU. Uh, we were involved in advising that. Uh, President Trump a few years ago put a major um, initiative in place to kind of revitalize the American drone industry. But that raises tensions too about whether government's role is to supply government specific needs or do a broader effort across industry. If all you care about is a niche government need, you can build a custom government product and not worry about the commercial market. But if you are trying to support more generally, changing the market that's a much harder ask involves a lot more money and you're working against market forces so these are some of the things that are being played out uh, right now in real time uh, the blue uas initiative from diu is probably the biggest thing going on right now um, on that front uh, another one is who can say yes uh, on drone security in other words who gets to decide that a drone is secure enough and this is not just a drone problem, this is an IoT problem. Uh, because government is a many headed beast, with not a monolith, uh, what you find is lots of different people across government want to use drones or want to use counter UAS systems. And everyone in government is worried about security, but no one has the mandate to say yes. 
uh, it's good enough. We reviewed the security. So what you have is a very nebulous situation right now where government knows it needs to have a clear process to endorse products. Industry knows they need a clear set of requirements. Industry will say, hey, just tell us what to build, what security standards you have, and we will build it. But those are often unpublished because uh, we're still kind of navigating as a government how to do this. And even if one agency says yes, other agencies may be a little afraid to take that and it won't be good enough for them. So you get a problem when there's not reciprocity on authorizations. And this has been a big deal in the drone industry. If anyone on the call has, has tried selling drones to government, you know this is a hot issue. Um, and this gets to questions of how we do security. And I already kind of talked about that, this old model of building a, you know, maybe a, a DOD or a government version versus the very fluid, fast moving, continuous deployment model of industry. So the last trend I wanna talk about here is movements in government to change how we think about security. And for that, we need to talk about this idea of the ATO, authority to operate, which is basically a permission slip to connect a device to a government network. That could be a piece of software, it could be hardware, or it could be a drone. The traditional way that you do an ATO, there's volumes of security controls published in various regulations that tell you exactly what security controls you need to implement. If you have a login screen, for example, you might need to lock out the user after a certain number of unsuccessful attempts. And under the old model, you would spend maybe months building your software, and then you would spend weeks documenting all security controls and handing over a paperwork pile to government reviewers who would review your paperwork, make sure you're in compliance, and then bless your release. Well, that works if you want to do a release every six months, but if you want to be like Netflix and deploy code hundreds of times per day, this doesn't work. So there has been a movement as DOD is trying to embrace DevOps uh, the Air Force has a process called Fast Track ATO now. Well, they still expect you to build a certain baseline of security controls, but they will come in and review your build pipeline. They'll make sure you have automated testing and uh, continuous monitoring and all these different things. And the third piece is they want red teaming. And the old way of thinking about this was if you just check all the boxes on the checklist, your code is secure. But anyone who works in security knows it's a very dynamic, living cat and mouse game as adversaries try and break into networks and we defend against them. So the thought of having red teams come in is that if we bring in friendly white hat red teams uh, to sort of poke around at our product, we will get a much more secure product because they're more likely to find bugs and we're more likely to fix them quickly. So a fast track ATO, as long as you get those ingredients, the security baseline, the red teaming and a continuous monitoring system, you can get permission to essentially continuously deploy your product. And we've seen some of this move towards red teaming with the Hack the Pentagon program from the Defense Digital Service where they helped bring in bug bounties to the Pentagon. They've done a number of similar events on different kinds of technology. And uh, that's been a big success. There's also a move towards a continuous ATO, which is basically a way of looking at an entire software factory and saying, okay, we validated your processes. You have a very good process to continuously manage your security. We're gonna bless your factory that you can make new products and have an ATO that's good for all of them. So these are all ways to try and grapple with the security um, uh, challenge there and move very similar to industry or at least more like industry than government typically does. Um, and going back to drones, what does this mean? So if you're in the drone landscape today, trying to sell to government, government is still trying to figure out how to think about security and IoT. We're still in a world where no one's quite empowered to say yes. DIU is currently working on a process that will allow anyone in industry to submit their drone for a review that will look more like this fast track process, will involve a security evaluation and probably red teaming. Um, there's other parts of government trying to do similar things. But this is way bigger than just drones. It's a challenge that governments are going to face with IoT devices, period. And, and the need for value, uh, doing security evals and keeping up with rapid change swamps government's capacity to handle all those security evals. And that's led to a lot of friction in the last few years. But these efforts are underway. And the last thing I want to mention, I have to kind of go over this one quickly because I am a little bit out of the space. It's been a couple of years. But for those who do want to work in these spaces, the Blue UAS program from DIU is one of the best avenues in. They fund both components and complete drones. There's efforts that even if you're not selected for the Blue UAS program to be able to get a security eval, get listed, 
Um, DIU's website has more information. DIU has this process called the CSO, the Commercial Solutions Opening. It's a contracting authority that lets them um, uh, rapidly go out to industry and bring in tech. You'll also find a lot of other organizations doing similar work. Any of the works organizations have various pathways for money. These SBIRs, Small Business Innovation Research Grants, uh, are a big thing lately where companies can often get a small amount of seed money and they go out and find a government customer and they can progressively get more funding. Um, I mentioned all these different units across the, the country or the globe, really, that are all out trying to procure things or do experimentation. There's a lot of different inroads to try and find your way into government there. And then I do think for the security community, with the move towards red teaming, there will be more and more opportunities to do red teaming as a service uh, to improve product quality and help government. So a lot to be done here. Uh, the drones, drones to me are a bellwether of where we're headed about this relationship between the public sector and the private sector of how we take commercial technology moving exponentially faster and um, bringing it into government. So I will stop there and uh, be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. It was super, super interesting and you covered a, a whole bunch of things. So uh, yeah, we can leave your screen up there for a little bit so people can grab your website and email. Um, and, you know, I want to kick off the first question with one of my own, and that's really, you know, with the humanitarian missions that you initially started out doing, obviously, there's been some time that heavy lift drones have changed since then. Do you know if there is anything even within government that is using those heavy lift drones to do humanitarian, you know, food missions type thing into active war zones? So, um, I haven't kept a close touch in the last couple of years, but I, I will say there was a number of companies that were being formed around the same time we were trying to do the humanitarian mission, um, Matternet, Zipline, others. Uh, some of those have got more legs. Our paradigm was very similar to what Zipline came along and built much better later with a more viable uh, organization. Uh, DIU contracted with a couple companies. Uh, I believe it was Valancey and um, Zipline for blood delivery as a, as a prototype mission, which I think is one of those good uses of a, a low mass, high value payload that you can carry with a small drone. Uh, I haven't, I've seen a lot of experimentation on the industry side. I've seen prototyping in government, but not to the scale I was envisioning. I will also say that having gone through that experience, experimented with it, I'm, I'm wary of the value of the small payloads. I knew that was a challenge going in and we were trying to find use cases like medical supplies where it might make sense. But with these small cheap drones, you really are so payload limited. Um, I kind of wonder or think maybe the sweet spot for humanitarian aid will be with larger platforms that are much more expensive. Uh, but those will only work in, in safer airspace where there's not a threat of being shot down. Mm, yeah, that's super interesting. And I mean, we're already seeing, you know, some heavy lift drones get to pretty fast speeds and so forth, but the, yeah. the faster they are, the more expensive and, and the risk that, you know, an adversary is going to get a hold of that. So I, if I can um, follow up on that, the, the calculation we wrestled with is how cheap can you get, we're trying to get the cost per payload per kilogram of payload down. So you could go a very cheap drone. Like we started out with literally foam board airplanes held together with hot glue that were maybe $200 that were, could be one way potentially. And it was like, how many trips can you get without getting shot down to get your, your, you know, mass up. But yeah, as you start getting to bigger platforms or heavy lift, the price goes up from $200 to $50,000. And one of those gets shot down that blows up the math for whether or not this paradigm makes sense. Mm, well, super interesting. Okay. Um, all right. I'll, I'll start lifting off some questions from others. Um, the one is, regarding the faster OODA loop. So it said, what was the main root cause um, of that that you changed? Was it finance or people access? And if it was people, how did you find, hire and incentivize great people to join a government department? Yeah. So uh, we, we did a lot of things. I could probably talk another hour about that. Um, we got experts together in a room. I, I was I had a lot of a depth of experience myself. My, my deputy was also a guy like me who'd built drones. He helped contribute code to Ardu Pilot. Um, and we had a few others. Uh, the way we brought in talent, we had to kind of hack the system to make to simplify a complex reality. We basically hired a contractor to bring in people for us. But instead of just taking whoever the contractor wanted to give us, we worked with the contractor to very selectively go out and find and, and attract great people. Um, 
the contractor gives you a lot more flexibility than directly hiring into government. There are also some government entities that do directly hire civilians um, a little bit higher up in the pay scales. You won't make as much in government as you make maybe in the private sector. But what we found is there's a lot of people who are very passionate and mission driven. They've been out just making money for the company. What they want to do is go make a difference. And we built a team ethos where people saw the team, loved the mission and wanted to be part of it. So that was the currency we were able to trade in was not so much monetary, but a, you're going to have a sense of purpose of being out helping protect people against drones. Mm, yeah, super interesting. And, and, you know, people talked about the Roach Squadron team for some time. So you obviously built quite a legacy there. You mentioned something about um, some of that team uh, doing some of the open source work, you know, RG Pilot or whatnot. Um, when you think about Blue SUAS and, and that style of things, you know, how much do you reckon we're going to kind of position ourselves towards the open source uh, schema of things rather than closed source? Or do you think it's still kind of up in the air, waited to be seen? That's a great question, and it's a hard one. I've always been a fan of open source. I was pretty involved in RD Pilot for a while. And I sort of believe that, particularly as we're trying to deal with a single monopoly by a single company, the, the way you, you break a monopoly is to commoditize the technology. And some of it's so specialized that the way you commoditize it, I think, is by making it common. You, you make a lot of things open source. There's great value in that. And we also, in government, care a lot about interoperability and we hate vendor lock. We don't want a company giving us a proprietary product and ratcheting up prices. Um, the challenge though, is we, I, as I was talking to companies, even as we were promoting open source, we did find a lot of resistance to that because companies often derive value from closed source, but also they felt like they could make better drones by owning the entire stack, which I am sympathetic to for sure. Um, you know, Mac OS is a more pleasant experience, heresy maybe to some of you than Linux um, for most people. But uh, I don't know. I do think there's a great value in both. And if nothing else, pursuing both gives options and options are what we want. Uh, okay. Um, there's a couple of people obviously saying, hi, Mark. So you've got a, a few that maybe know you, but um, a follow-up question from that is, uh, when you were talking about the red team, did you emulate actual threat actors or did you have a technology focus? We, that, that's, that's a great question. Uh, not really. I mean, the main actor at the time was Islamic State and they they did everything and, and just stuff you can find in open sources. You'll go out and find a range of attacks from, you know, a Phantom 3 dropping a grenade to X8 Skywalkers and um, I initially had a vision for progressively building up capabilities from like one Phantom 4 dropping a mock grenade up through like a four ship flight of Skywalkers flying RF dark. And what I quickly realized was DoD was not ready for most of that. We were still really stuck on the single quadcopter problem at the time. Uh, there's been a big emphasis in trying to research these things, but we were, we were getting a little more ahead of just where everybody was at. And I think in some ways we're still there of, man, this is a hard problem. Like, we still need to crack the one drone and, and before we take on multiple. So um, there were just limits to how far we could push the red teaming. The advantages were still, I think, on the red side. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting. When you think about it, you know, you could either look at some really unique um, TDPs that you haven't observed or they're, you know, they're quite, they're the most dangerous rather than the most common. Uh, and then you could look at just what the most common thing is. But if you're still focused on that single quadcopter problem and it's not being completely handled, uh, yeah, it makes for a really interesting problem set. Yeah, it would be fun to go full red team. We could come up with some pretty novel stuff uh, <laughs> that scare people. But um, but yeah, and, you know, and it goes back to the requirements problem, though. If you're in a requirements driven system, the requirement that goes up is going to be for that one quadcopter. And we saw this for several years. We would get a prioritized list based on what drones were in theater. Whereas if you step outside the requirements process and you just know a lot about drones and know a lot about the market, you're going to see things on the horizon that have not yet appeared on the battlefield. And you're going to start leaning ahead, trying to build for that. And maybe that was one advantage we had in Rogue Squadron. And we, we were a little bit cushioned by having government money. Whereas if you're maybe a private sector company trying to build for the next threat, it can often be hard to get that traction if they haven't seen the threat on the battlefield yet. Mm. Sure. I think demonstrations okay. and range activities can help with some of that or simulations to kind of build that case. 
Yeah, and you know sometimes those um those simulations or, or demo days in a way uh, the the results aren't published. Sometimes they kept uh, quiet, you know, to protect mm -hmm. the vendors or, or defense. Um, you had a slide there that was the ammo too expensive for the uh, the railgun, and the question here is: Is that something you think currently affects counter US? It is an issue. Uh, I'm, I won't pick on particular companies or anything, but the traditional way of doing defense acquisition is to go with a major defense company and paying them a lot of money. And it's not that those companies are greedy. It's that those companies are built to do business with DOD. They know how the system works and how to deal with the huge bureaucratic burden that we put on companies. And that's a very expensive way to do things. So we tend to brute force things with a lot of money. And I've definitely seen that approach in places. Um, with some very, very expensive Canada US weapon systems that uh, didn't perform much better than much lower cost startups. And those startups are often at a disadvantage competing because honestly, for, from DOD's perspective, it's easier to work with a big existing company. It's easier sometimes to spend $10 million than it is to spend $10,000. Um, the processes are better established. So what that means for a maybe a lower price competitor. Well, the first thing I will say is I, I don't wanna make government look too bad here. At the end of the day, the product quality speaks. The people who did this for a long time, I get to know people all over government, different countries worked together. You figured out very quickly who knew what they were talking about and those people began to understand which technologies actually worked and which didn't. So eventually the kind of truth comes out, but um, trying to get those companies on contract could be a challenge sometimes Another pathway for companies that's worth consideration is to get acquired by one of the big companies. It's maybe not the, the ideal solution that we might think of, but it, it, that does happen, and that can be a, a viable way to, to um, get into one of those longer-term agreements. So where we're at now is a lot of the big Canada US programs are more like conglomerates of, of different companies working together, and there's a lot of opportunity there. Mm. No, that's that's really interesting and just want to touch on the rogue squadron aspect of it in regards to you know government taking these small fast agile you know sections or departments and utilizing that in you know different types of warfare do you think it made an impact that has kicked off other similar programs and in, in other kind of verticals or do you think rogue squadron is a you know a unique case you know what what does the kind of horizon look like for the us gov and what they did and how it kind of looks like now i think i i don't know that we drove the change but we were part of a movement of other teams like us um there's there's other teams in the us i'm aware of teams in the uk australia other places they all have a very similar ethos and there's also other software teams in the us and probably elsewhere that are trying to bring at least more of a DevSecOps type approach, more agile approach to other problem domains. And we all kind of know each other and work together. It's all kind of new and those people find each other because they're small communities. So there's a tidal wave of support moving for this kind of, of thinking, but it requires a lot of institutional change. You need to embrace the software development best practices. Uh, just basic DevSecOps stuff. You need cloud infrastructure, which is hard for DOD because, you know, trying to land a cloud contract with all the controversies right. over competition is hard. Um, you you need to get the talent, but you also have to think about, uh, we made the argument that, that software is not, developing software wasn't um, like an acquisition, that it was a war fighting function. So in the same way that you'd have a soldier walking through a, a rice paddy with a rifle, you would have soldiers sitting at a computer writing software in real time. And that's not always something that should be outsourced or, or built into a product. It's a very living dynamic mm. computer. And that is a, it's a hard concept to explain in, in government laws get it wrong. But that was how we operated is, is treating it as a war fighting function. And, uh, you know, every day we were keeping up with a moving technology. Mm, no amazing uh, and mark i've noticed just a little bit of glitching out on your side now so 
um, just so we don't have it uh, have it continue to happen. I might end the questions there. There's actually quite a few, and there's a lot of discussion um, going on in the comments that I, I simply can't keep up with the number of questions. So maybe there's some that you might be able to answer directly in there. Um, but I just want to say a real thanks for joining us today. Uh, appreciate the talk. It was super interesting and, and hope to have you back sometime as well. Can I ask one question? I see the private chat here, but I don't see whatever the public chat is. I don't know how to get to that. Sure. So that's on the YouTube uh, live stream. So I'll, I'll flick you a link for that, uh, and we'll, okay. we'll make sure you've got access to that. Um, no problem. Perfect.